Welcome to the Lost Signals Reviews, the American Film Institute's Top 100, where we critique the supposed 100 greatest American movies of all time. Join us as we decide if they're worthy of the Mox Top 100. Hello, and welcome to The Lost Signals discusses the American Film Institute's 2007 list. <laughs> Tonight we're doing Snow White, um, and I'm here with my friends, uh, Jonathan Ian Manzer. And the godless witch burned in the ashes. Oh, that's the other uh, story, sorry. <laughs> uh, Scott Thurlow. Hi-ho, fuck this movie, yo. <laughs> and Joe Soria. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Am I the hottest bee in the kingdom? <laughs> All right. So, does anybody have a funny log line before you start? I got a, it's not a log line, I guess, but snow shite in the seven boars. But, like, that's really more of a recommendation. So, I think yeah. someone else might have a better one. I think I just did mine. So, uh, that's my variant. But, uh, you know, I guess not even, isn't mirror, mirror, isn't it magic mirror? I don't think she ever it's says mirror, mirror. mirror. I thought you said magic mirror uh, in the first one. Maybe yeah. uh, I know people say a mirror mirror. I could be, could be wrong. But did right. anyone else check that? I'm. I could have I sworn don't she know said something hand. like slave in the mirror or something like that. Mm, that's even better. That was All like right. uncomfortable. So I looked up who did voice the mirror, and uh, it was a white guy. So. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Uh, well, it, Disney's kind of come under fire, so you always got to check your targets, but um i'm not going to uh you know go there um so um why don't we start off with ian why don't you tell us about the plot snow white's this hot nature goddess of sorts although not quite a, a goddess but she does have control over uh woodland creatures um uh, and i say she's hot because that's a plot point uh her stepmother is upset that she's hotter than she is so the stepmother hires an assassin to take her out. Uh, Snow White flees, <laughs> falls upon, uh, finds a house uh, filled with seven dwarves, and uh, yeah, the stepmother decides to take <laughs> action in her own hands and poison Snow White, so that it's not not assassination, so that she falls unconscious and will be buried alive, and then. Uh, uh, and then you know the the dwarves chase her into the mountains in a storm, and in attempting to kill the dwarves, dies. And there's a lot of songs in between, but it's actually a fairly uh, it's either it's a movie that either turn into a browser's plot, or a um, or a horrific uh, revenge flick. But uh, yeah, overall it's based off of uh, the Brothers Grimm's Schneewittchen. Uh, a very famous tale. It delves quite a lot into like kind of mythological uh, symbols. Uh, yeah, symbols in there. But overall, I mean, you know, it's 1930s Disney, yeah, and yeah, it's it's a short tale that is uh, a, a padded uh, German musicals. So um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's a classic tale. I'm going to give it like probably a two. You're right. I mean, it's based upon the original Grim fairy tale. And yes, the variations. It's a 1.5, rounded up to a two. It's the tale of Snow White sung at you a lot. So sure. Like, and if it hasn't been clear before, let me make it clear here. I do not like this film personally, viscerally. Now, I understand what, you know, why it's on, completely, we'll get to it. Why it's here, why it's on the AFI, why we're we'll even discussing it in the AFI show. However, just saying plot-wise, sure, give it a two. It, it tells you the plot of Snow White and sings it at you, and it's not like it's confusing or you're not knowing what's happening. It wraps it all up. The witch gets defeated, and Snow White goes out with Prince Charming. Sure, boom, wrap up, the end, two. Yeah, I mean, this is a... Uh... Yeah, I guess it's very it's a it's a stayed quick plot for, for it was probably intended for kids or at least for you know being a quick shortcut right and to throw those songs in there and to make it like a dark musical uh, of the period of the post depression period of you know um, so 
I mean, yeah, the only thing I would, you, you know, we yada yada is, is like almost the early brutality and brutality out. You said it at the ed- latter part, but I mean, it's like, can you go out there and can you kill her? And can you bring me her heart? Like we have this character, send another character to kill the princess, bring our heart in a box. It's part a of the ca- original tale though too. Yeah, no, and it, I'm just saying, but in a castle full of bones, you know, like it's, uh, you know, a little more than plot, like these are add-ons they're not just a plot but they're definitely detailed at least actually joe to to back that up there is that one scene where she goes down to the dungeon and there's the skeleton reaching out for water and she literally kicks the uh uh, the uh, the jug at the skeleton i mean there's fairly dark uh imagery in this big time and i think you know you have um the working scenes so there is like a plot of uh, you know, yeah, they, he meets the dwarfs. They don't go back to the work necessarily, but there is just basically she goes and cleans up. She kind of ingratiates her to people that put her up. I mean, you know, as, uh, again, these are small details, but there's a little bit more here. But still, yeah, when it comes to plot and narrative, uh, specifically, this is a two. And I know uh, this is probably the spot I'd like to take a minute, talk about like why this to me is, you know, we, we've done this on most of the AFI movies, but this movie is 80. What are we talking about? 83 years old. Um, it's older than your grandparents. It's eight plus decades old. Um, and it's still, for, for that, I don't know how many 80-year-old movies kids these days are going to be watching or anyone's going to be watching. So um, in the contextual time period of what it is, it is uh, like the, the classic bearer for all to come, for all the princess and maybe negative connotations for that, for the his, you know, historical, the entire basis of all of Disneydom. Um, you know, uh, it was a movie that could have been, that was attempted to be made, uh, like the first effort by Disney to make a full length movie, to make a full length animated movie, make something for kids. Mostly kids were shorts movies. And, you know, he tried to make this for what, $250,000 ended up costing, I think $1.5 million. Um, it was, at the- which was huge. Um, you know, they called it Disney's folly. They called it, um, like a danger. And instead it was like Judy Garland in the front row, you know, celebrating it and becoming the biggest movie of all time till gone with the wind. And then was it, well, maybe not wizard of Oz didn't outclips it monetarily, but you know, maybe culturally as like it's a uh, follow-up. So um, yeah, I mean, two on the story. Uh, two, I think it's a three on its historical context and on importance. Uh, so two, a str- good, strong two for me. Also uh, it, it, I think adjusted for inflation, it's still, ranks in the top 10 uh, of money makers of all time. Uh, so yeah, it might've been a folly at the uh, moment, but uh, it has, but, but also uh, to go on to what you're saying, it gave permission to allow fantasy. I think so. Wizard of Oz was a direct response uh, to this. Um, and it, every single, from everything from Marvel and DC nowadays to uh, all the history of all these kind of fantasy things, Oh, to the success of Snow White. So yeah, historically, it's incredibly important. Um, yeah, so I agree with you guys on the two. Uh, the ending where she, the ending where um, I, uh, Melissa Maleficent, I guess that's her name, uh, is killed. She's on the this parapet, and she's trying to push a boulder down or leverage one with the with a um, a uh, stick, and lightning strikes and knocks her down, and the boulder falls. So not only did she hit whatever was on the ground, but then the boulder fell on top of her. So she got smashed. Sure. Like Joe um, said, there's some dark little yeah, moments. But, throughout. but also I realized this is a shared universe because this there was a deer with a baby deer. And at some point she was talking about an orphan. And it was, you know, right when the mother deer is like caressing the baby deer. So I'm assuming that Bambi was born, came <laughs> over and helped Snow White, and then went back. Uh, so his her his mom could die in the fire i love that well there's there's also pairs of all these animals the whole time it's like noah's ark out there but only for cute animals that are going to be in disney tales for the next 50 years i saw chip and dale out there i saw a rabbit from some movie and all the characters from robin hood and the files maybe boxes yeah so um you know you see all the little uh the starting of all those things that become like cornerstones of basically film itself i mean in essence uh right right there uh even in that scene uh, but i did laugh i'm thinking like where are the bears like where is it what is this forest that has nothing but like little creatures and and whistling little birds how many little baby birds are hanging out in the forest versus uh you know dangerous animals yeah 
I got your answer. Easier to draw birds than bears. Cost less. <laughs> Uh, well, they, they end up drawing a lot of bears uh, at some point. And, what, and, and I also wanted to point out that the uh, the castle at the end was in the sky. And she did do a whole prayer thing where she's kneeling down and saying her prayer. So there's a whole Christian imagery there. So in a lot of ways, it's just like, well, did she die? And, you know, it, did Prince Charming, is is he like the, is he like when the angels taking her to heaven? or something He's like Jesus. That? He's Jesus. Um, because the castle was in the sky and this was before Miyazaki's castle in the sky. So, um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, li I like it. I, li I, I like to think that the evil, which actually won on this. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was a murder suicide thing or no, it was a double murder. A mur yeah, whatever. Right. Well, I, there's, there's, a, there's a yada yada of, of the Prince part of this, which I think is actually the other on, uh, maybe modern take of like, this is even, it's two dueling women i mean yes the dwarves help uh help her but i mean it really is like uh female like violence and like uh you know the vengefulness nature and maybe it's a negative connotation but you know snow white is not she she is maybe a little um you know naive but you know she also is is kind right there is something in kindness and showing off the two literal you know jekyll and hyde which is another inspiration listed for this movie of like the two sides of the coin the pure evil and the pure kindness and then uh what meets in between so yeah um i was gonna say we're uh delving into themes it seems like mm -hmm. so scott sure i mean like all right thing again i try to remove my bias like the themes, like, they're literally sung or said at you, and, like, they're not deep, maybe, per se, but they're, like, also not, they're resonant, they're, they're relevant, at least, right? It, it most goes uh, to what you just said, Joe, like, sure, you got sort of naive, like, pure, like, I want to help everybody, and I'm a good soul, and then, like, um, on the other side of the coin, you know, the evil witch Maleficent is, like, jealous of her, and, like, I want to be the most, like, loved and narcissistically worshipped person in this fantasy kingdom world whatever right and then like you got like so, sort of like maybe i guess some sub themes there where like hey uh you know like w make sure you wash well like <laughs> it's just gonna seem like jokingly like trolly in a sense but i guess i'm gonna give it a one only because like the fact that since as we said it comes from original fairy tales which have all, always, especially the grim fairy tales, definitely have a moral, right? They're not the void of morals or themes or anything. Now, maybe they're a little bit toned down in the Disney version of it, but they certainly do not shy away from at least, some, again, like we said, some of the darker slash more like, you know, you know um, uncomfortably real aspects of it, even if it's viewed through a fantasy window framework, we'll say, right? So... That's fine, sure. Now, did I like the way the way they were conveyed? Maybe not. We'll speak to that later. But what is contained therein, and like what the film is trying to convey to you via this story, which is again already at least a lot of components of it already in place from much earlier in a uh, collection of fairy tales. It's fine. They did it. They did it perfectly well, and I'll have to give it a one. So. Well, the Grimm's fairy tale, uh, it doesn't actually differ all too much from it, aside from uh, uh, cannibalization of the heart um, uh, for immortality, I believe, uh, multiple attempts on her life in different methods, and then uh, uh, Mal Maleficent is forced to dance to her death at the end uh, using red hot uh, iron slippers. But, you know, that's a little too dark for... Uh, uh, I and perhaps if they showed all of the attempts in life, that would be a little too uh, uh, Overbearing. Yeah, complicated for kids. Uh, but thematically, I think that Disney stole from a lot of different societies from this. Uh, I vibe from kind of the nature, the young, young kind nature, the old. She, even though, yeah, she, she's a witch and she has a lot of death imagery around her. When you first meet her, she's very... I, I feel kind of a wintry, icy type yeah, uh, sure. character, which they would explore in uh, other uh, movies. But yeah, like, yeah, they delved into mythology, and I think to a certain extent uh, pulled it off, even if it was a replication and not something particularly original. I like that. 
Yeah, uh, the themes are honestly not the strongest one uh, in this movie. I think they're pretty basic and pretty universal. Um, you know, it's a mid-level one. There's not, they're not, not there. Exactly. They're kind of just uh, very, very, very standard for uh, the happily ever after type of tale um, and the basis of all to come. So again, so mid-level one, uh, you know, they're there. Not but, there much was, to say. but there is also that comparison of motherhood in there where uh, you have the stepmother who's very uh, uncaring, unkind. Cool. And you were mentioning earlier about the washing and all that, but it was really reinforcing the role of uh, mothers in uh, like what a proper mother should do. Uh, washing her kids, caring after them, all of that, which is m always maybe, un oh, well, rewatching this uncomfortable that the dwarves were at times treated like children, well, and, and other yeah. times they're ancient beings. That it reinforces the like love conquers all and wishing well mm -hmm. aspects of life. It's like, uh, cool, you know, like if we're gonna go on, are we gonna break up the princess story? This is a princess story. This is a princess pro you know, a variation of princess Certainly. problems. So, you know, what what more are you expect? Yeah, I mean, a <laughs> big one. Um, there doesn't seem to be t too many people in this country or whatever they are either. There seems to be four people um, or th three. I don't know who where all the g gems are going, um, but no one's in that castle with her except for a mirror. Um, so. Uh, woodsman and Snow White and the Queen, I guess. Right, it's, a, a, it's, it's a huntsman, all right? Come on. I mean, it's the one person named in, in the movie, and then they have their own movie uh, in, in 90 years later or whatever. So, um, yeah. So. No, no, just, I agree. Like, mid tier one, just because, like, yeah, it's not the void of them. They might be a little basic, like a little, like, you know, of course known, but that's given the source material. So I'll just back that up, and that's pretty much how I'm cutting up. What do you think, Chris? Um, I was gonna say you guys put a positive spin on it because the uh, the whole uh, vanity thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the unfortunate implications. Now looking back 80 years, and I, I hate to look like it because there's so much going on, and I'm really fucking sick of hearing about cancel culture and what you know and woke culture because, as far as I'm concerned, both got, both sides are all sides are guilty of the same fucking thing, and I try to be aware of that myself. Um, and I will call hypocrisy out of myself. So. Um, but you guys brought up some really good, uh, uh, with, with regard to, uh, themes, you got actually more out of it than I did. Cause I was sitting here, like, I was kind of like analyzing it in a weird way, not just because of the, um, you know, gender stereotypes that we've experienced, but just in terms of, um, movies like this on the AFI, so many tropes are based upon these films that is so hard sometimes we, yeah, to those, remove. I think we just definitely keep that in perspective because of you know the march of time and what the influence yeah. so i mean when i saw this the first thing i think of is like enchanted which i love i love enchanted i think it's, i love that movie um but it is but it is just a distillation of all the um you know the disney films like uh, that one specifically is a little more akin to uh um, sleeping beauty but be that as it may so I was having a very hard time of like trying to get a theme out of this because, you know, it was so muddled in my brain. Like, okay, I'm, you know, at one point I asked Beth, I'm like, wait, does this da -da -da part happen in, you know, this movie or another movie? And I'm like, all right, which, which movie is it with the three fairy godmothers? Uh, Sleeping Beauty because the Cinderella has the one fairy godmother. So it's, it's one of these things where everything just kind of mushes together. Right. So like I said, you know, you know, analyzing the 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 gender stereotypes aside, because again, if we're going to be going through tropes, mm -hmm. those cannot be overlooked. And I'm not making a thing on like woke culture or cancel culture because I don't believe in cancel culture at the fucking all. Um, but um, you know, you can't, you can't give it the derived part from the the movies that come after it when it is the first one of all of them, right? Yeah, you, like you're saying, like Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, everything else, right? Yeah, those movies are the same of this. Like, there's a ball in Cinderella, right? There's uh, she's sleeping the whole time, and the other one, I don't know. They, they to me, I was thinking like, wait, which one? Like I watching this movie, I'm like, what is the story? It's like I don't. I remember the dwarfs. I was like, I know that there's a princess and something bad happens and that's it. I like that's the, all of them. You know, I couldn't tell you the difference before this movie, what the difference was. So. I was waiting uh, for the witch to turn into the dragon, but that's another. <laughs> that's part. Sleeping Beauty. Yeah. <laughs> all sort of melts together. But, but Chris, to your point, though, is that, yeah, this is the codifier, but 
you can actually read academic papers tracing this back to like Greek origins of right, this right. style. So yeah, like it's not just the codifier for Disney film, but it is the long tradition of passing down these myths yeah. throughout history. Yeah. Oh, and I, I agree with you, but with regard to, with the American Film Institute, when we look at, you know, I always take it from how did this contribute to American culture for better or worse? And whether it was a reflection of or perpetuation of, you know, certain stereotypes outside or uh, tropes within art. Um, so, I mean, that was the only thing I was kind of commenting on. Well, uh, to, to uh, comment on that, though, this did start off the Disney tradition of, uh, your outer uh, ugliness equates with uh, uh, ill intent. Uh, your your outside reflection reflects uh, your outside reflect uh, self. So yeah, yeah. Until the Hinchbrook in Notre Dame, it's more of uh, uh, if you're ugly, you deserve to be because you're a monster. Because you're obviously, e which is is true in my case. But um, I was saying, you're, my you're either evil or you're the laughing stock. So. Yeah. Well, in my standard way of looking, I don't know which list you, you know, AFI updated at some points. So I assume you guys use the newer list or older list. Or say Whatever one has is at 34, is. We, we, 34, we have... right? So it's surrounded by Annie Hall, which is a female empower, you know, not empowerment movie, but a, maybe a can't somebody with a female centric and one flew over the cuckoo's nest. So honestly, uh, you know, thematically, it's right in the middle there for sure. Uh, so <laughs> not sure. bad placement, uh, but it moved I up I think, yeah. in the 10 years. I think it moved up 10 spots, honestly. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. So. Because I think I, yeah. we started when we started this. I think they renewed it in 2017. Because this, no, we've been using the same list ever since no, but, we started. But, but what I'm saying is, we're using the 2007 <laughs> list because yeah. at the time that was the most recent list. Yeah. We're not going to believe be that like, is the case. We're not going to be like halfway through the three years in going, oh shit, now we've got to change. The not list. changing <laughs> horses midstream, I suppose. But uh, yeah, can you yeah, imagine if all the Jimmy Stewarts were then like in 2017 off, and you like and Scott had to endure all those, and it's. Mm. Like, all to say is I'm in, I'm in favor of canceling woke culture as my random joke at the end of themes, but still giving it a one. <laughs> <laughs> nice, I like that. Canceling woke culture, that's awesome. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's a whole different discussion. But so Joe, why don't you talk about the antagonist? Yeah, as the antagonist, she's a baller. You know, she going straight for it. She's not having in this bitch is going to be taking her spot on top. You know what I mean? <laughs> But for seriously, she's scary, and it's very clear she's an antagonist. Um, she does not like that anyone else could be fairer than her. There's only one other woman person being in. There can be only one. Um, also, you know, Angelina Jolie kind of looks like her, so I'm gonna give him points for that. That later on, you know, I, like retro's actively. I, what do you? Yeah, yeah. I, I, give, I give her. I like the cape. Also, I like that she she has no hair. Like she just wears. I don't know if it's like a cat suit with it's like the a, Ming the Merciless. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, whatever that is, she's doing that. It's like I'm the fairest of all. You could see my eyes, my giant green eyes, um, my my pale pale skin, and uh, and I'm and, and and you better tell me what I want, mirror, or you know, just break the mirror. You know, it's the mirror's fault. The whole movie is the mirror's fault. I don't know. If the antagonist. The mirror is <laughs> is deep. Yeah. And I didn't even notice her eyes because there's that green eyes thing with envy and so forth. It's just like, huh. Interesting. Yeah, and, and I did like uh, so I think I looked up the I, I, the original ending because um, I, I you know I forgot what ha I actually looked up because I, I forgot what happened to her in the movie uh, I know that, and then I looked up they chased her off but then it appears that in the story uh, when she arrives to uh, Snow White's wedding which I guess we didn't get to the wedding at least so we don't have to sit through a wedding in this movie um, she arrives to find a pair of hot iron shoes waiting for her and she's forced to put them on and dance to death yeah, that is it, yeah. something I would like to watch. Uh, animated. Um, I said that too. I, I, for sure. Um, you know, I think that's good. I, I, I think, uh, yeah, like you mentioned, the, the Greek Greek version of this as well. Um, there, there's so much good violence that could really be put to, to work here that, you know, between that one, the other historical, uh, you know, uh, the tongue through the arrow ending of this movie, there's, uh, you know, all kinds of cool stuff. So, yeah, she's a bitch. Um, it's very obvious. She's very angry. She's very cranky. There might be some reasoning for it. We don't know what it is. Um, but she's very antagonistic, so she gets a one for being the antagonist. Well, I mean, we do know what it is. She wants to be the fairest of them all, and apparently is not, according to her magic mirror. So therefore, like you said, like, but so you're right. Like, I don't have much more to say, but I will back you up, giving you a one. Mark me down as a one, Chris, because yes, it's the codifier as 
I think you said E, like of like the evil witch thing where like about halfway through when she after her first attempt fails, right? I'm gonna send the woodsman after her, and the woodsman falls in love or just can't kill Snow White. So the okay, huntsman. Fine. Whatever it is, man. It's the same. He ain't no Chris Woodsman, Hunsman. Hunsman. The Woodsman is the rapist guy played by Kevin Bacon in the movie The Woodsman, I believe. So right, well, uh, you know. we'll review that later. <laughs> but in this one, at least, so after I'm just saying, after that plot fails, after that little like segment fails, she's like, okay, I'll just do it myself. I'll become an evil witch and poison an apple, like brew, brew the poison and like you know trick Snow White into eating it. So she's a one-dimensional villain, but because it's so rever- maybe 1.5. But it's so it reverberates throughout all the stuff, like throughout all kind of fairy tales like this. And she's such the er example. And yes, is menacing, is scary, or at least and probably much more so if you're like eight, ten years old watching this shit, right? So like, and she she's motivated. She knows what she's doing. She's not incompetent about it, or at least not to. She's not very incompetent. She might be a, like a little slip up, but we've seen much more incompetent villains. So. In that term, one for me, unless you guys convince me otherwise. She dies thinking she won. And I have to give credit to her. And also, she doesn't go out like a punk. <laughs> like, uh, like I, I felt that she was so... She was an inch away from victory. Uh, if she had taken a different path, she would have escaped those oh, dorms. And then would have come back for uh, a, another sequel to kill Snow White. I, I like her determination, so I'm giving her a one for that. No, I agree with Ian. I mean, I agree with you all. I was going to give him one, give her a one anyway. But Ian, yeah, you actually gave her some uh, even more agency, which yeah. was appreciated. So I'm giving her a one. Which leaves me to the protagonist, Snow White. I believe she's the protagonist. I know she's supposed to be the protagonist. I'm. I, the funny thing is, we've had some movies we reviewed a lot lately where the protagonist is truly the fish out of the water that was either acting or mostly reacting to, um, you know, what was going around her. I mean, we discussed with Johnny Mnemonic that maybe he wasn't the best protagonist for certain <laughs> reasons, but uh, so this one's really funny because now we're right back into the middle of flying between like what a true protagonist is being a complete fish out of water because she does have some agency so the world doesn't need to be explained to her. She's actually in a weird way explaining the world, like say contemporary society to the dwarves. So it's kind of turning that protagonist role kind of on its side, especially for this time. Um, but I, I'm not going to get over analytic about it because I'm just, because I'm, I'm prone to, I'm prone to babble, but I'm going to give her one because she does an effective job. She basically does what she's supposed to. And like I said, she has like a weird different agency than most protagonists do. But, you know, she is a central part of the story and she is um, the reason we get to see all the things we do and for whatever reason, learn for all the more or less uh, learn all the things we do. So, you know, I guess she's getting a default one. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll have to say that uh, she learns in her time away what it takes to be a good ruler. Uh, she uh, she's an empathetic character to begin with, but she uh, learns to take care of others. And granted, yeah, that might be the uh, shallowest character development in the world. But you know, monarchs aren't born monarchs; they uh, they, they they become that. So um, I think she earned her place at Prince Charming's side through her. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I don't know where I'm going with that. Anyway, probably. <laughs> I was trying to work an Oprah interview in there somewhere, but like, <laughs> please do not do that. Or at least not the time for it. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know, dudes. Like, I'm kind of split. Like, I see your point. Like, of course she's the protagonist. There's no argument there. Now, is she a good, effective one? This is where my bias might show through. Like, or at least my anti-bias, my distaste for this film in a general way she's fleshed out yeah yeah joe you mentioned she's naive you mentioned like of course she, you get uh, echoes of like persephone like things like that like you're from much earlier mytho historical like tales uh at least featuring a female feature sure i guess you what know, i'll give her one here and whatever points i, I might take away that i'm going to take away from a, a different question so 
Yeah. While she is the first and foremost character, and you're right, like singing slash explaining to you, like expositioning to you in some way, like how the world works. And she does have an arc at least. Like she goes through a struggle and like has like a heroine's ish journey, like to, to a degree, like for an okay degree. Someone born into royalty who remains in royalty, yeah, she has an arc. Sure, right. Like again, uh, there's a scale there, but I'm just saying, like it, it's like a, a, I'll give her Snow White, the animated character, a one in this version of it. Fine. Yeah, I think you're going to hate rate this into an eight, pretty much, Scott. That's what it sounds like to me when you're getting this one. That's <laughs> just what I've been thinking into the math here. You know, uh, I don't know where the points are coming out. My score. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm like, I'm not hearing any zeros here, so just making a note. Uh, they're coming. They're coming. I bet they are. The recommendation is going to be a hard zero. So, um, but yeah, Snow White. You know. She's cute. She has this like uh, Marilyn Monroe type voice. Obviously, that's afterwards, but it's like the predecessor of like cute, like uh, nymphy. Like she has goes. this. She has this dress that even after she cleans, it's perfect and unkempt. It's perfectly kempt. It never gets dusty. Oh, you have a you have a note on that, Chris? No, no, no. Go on. I, I've I mean, got something to say yeah, this. I was gonna say uh, she likes to. Uh, she likes to clean. She likes to cook. She doesn't even need to be asked. I mean, she's she seems game. She seems down to clown. And uh, what'd you have, Scott? Go ahead. Like, I, yeah. Sorry, I had my note. Apparently, she can control or at least tell animals to do household chores. Like, that's part of her power, I guess. Like, strong. That's a strong power. You, I'm you, gonna sing, say. you sing hard enough at animals, and they'll do your fucking yeah, chores. That goes back to the nature mythology. Yeah, so. you, know, you know her stepmother had, can make magical uh, tr things and turn herself into the ugliest person on Earth while trying to be the most beautiful person on Earth. Maybe she could just make a wish or make a spell where she actually just is the most beautiful person, and then she doesn't have to worry about all of this stuff, and then she's done. Like, she seemed to have to go and turn into an old lady to confuse her stepdaughter that she never talked to in the movie as a human being. Uh, you never see them interact. I don't know if that's, you know, yada, yada, but like, so it's basically like Snow White's all alone. She's like kind of, it's not Cinderella where I don't know if she, when she's in the castle, she's a cleaning, but it always seems like she's cleaning. You'd think there are people who work there that are cleaning if she's a queen, but she's smart enough to run away and hide uh, or at least get away. She's good with people and animals. She's not mean to anybody. She's kind to all of the dwarves and all kinds of people, which is a good queenly trait that we usually find as the learning part at the end of the movie. Um, and then, you know, and then she has this spirit where she says, and what do you do when things go wrong? You sing a song. And you know what? She sings a lot of songs and people, people like songs. Kids love songs. Um, the other question that I had was, after watching this movie and many movies after it, are we sure it's a good idea to run and hide in the woods? Because it does save her, but Always. it doesn't seem to be a good idea. But it's um, also a good idea to go into whatever ramshackle house you find in the woods. <laughs> small, with small Always doors. Always works out. Always fine. <laughs> <laughs> but the dust, it's like, they're like so upset when he cl she cleans my dust, you know? And I, that's like my favorite kind of trope. And like, why did you touch my stuff? Oh, you touched my stuff. You're hot. That's good. And then Grumpy comes in and it's like, are we sure he's not just Grumpy because he has blue balls? Like everybody else, like these guys are getting, they're getting it. Like We'll get to that in secondary, but I guess. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, so, I mean, we haven't mentioned the dwarves, but uh, they're very important. The movie's called Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. So right. talk together. Uh, Snow White, as the protagonist of the film Snow White and Seven Doors, gets a, a, a good, a hearty one, a hearty, a heartfelt one. Beth pointed out um, that uh, Snow White, uh, watching it, she pointed out that this is before the bar barbarification of uh, Disney princesses. So she doesn't have the. Babooms. Yeah. And, you know, no waste. Uh, you know, the proportion is what you're, I guess, no, but she gonna... looks actually like a real woman as opposed to you know, being a Barbie. Um, so, um, yeah, that's the only thing I wanted to point out because you were talking about the aesthetics of it. I just figured it would be something to point out. All right, so we're all giving Snow, Snow White a one. <laughs> that was a really Stop. difficult thing to say. I, just... <laughs> I would have said, you know, anyway. I think I got a straight six. I oh, almost wow. said that's a hard thing, but you know, I wasn't going to go there, but hey, I just did. So anyway, digging <laughs> myself out of this one, Ian, why don't we throw it to you with uh, supporting characters? They do a surprisingly good job of 
giving each of the dwarves a unique personality, even if they are known by like one distinct feature. Uh, I think specifically Doc and Grumpy come off uh, very well. And the idea of trying to win over Grumpy um, is a, uh, like, I, I, she bakes him a cake and writes his name on it. I mean, like, that is a, a pie. Hi. That, that is a way to win uh, a dwarf's heart. Do you think she may went for every single one of them and put their name on it? I was like, because they only I think it's implied. Them. Yeah. Well, she, no, she did say at one point she wants Grumpy to, she prayed that Grumpy would like her. So, so I enjoyed the dwarves. I think they're the, my favorite part of this film. Aside from one other small character in this, throughout all of her woodland creatures, there's a turtle who is struggling in vain to keep up with everyone else, and he's always left behind for comedic effect. Mm -hmm. And never have I seen something more relatable in a Disney, Disney film than that turtle struggling at every single moment of this film. So uh, I'm probably giving it a pretty strong one. That turtle is obviously Sisyphus, and that's probably why I'm giving him one. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I guess the woodland creatures, like you said, you're like the fucking deer and the birds and the squirrels and all that shit. Like, when she commands, she sings at them in a lovely way. Why don't you do the dishes? Why don't you sweep the floor? Whatever, like all that shit. Like, fine. Yes, of course, the dwarves are like, you know, like not second fiddle. Like, they're the, they're just behind her. As you said, the titular dwarves, if we'll say. Yes. Perhaps, <laughs> Did love perhaps, dwarves. perhaps though she doesn't control uh, woodland creatures. She's so traumatized by being almost killed by the huntsman that she it's all in her all head. the peasants. That would explain the empty I mean, world. That'd be amazing. Uh, like, uh, she's just uh, so yeah. traumatized that she's seeing all of these characters. As like if dwarves. that was a reveal or like e even the original story, <laughs> that'd be fucking sick. But the, there's no implication of that, I, I, I don't think, in, the, in this film. However, like, sure, of course. I mean, the dwarves are, they're literally named, they're like defining characteristics. So, like, of course, like, there's no, it's clear, right? And you're right, Joe, like, or one of you said, like, she's trying to win them all over, and like, some are more easily won over than others, but at least she's teaching them something, and they do have some, an arc. They learn something, she learns a little bit here and there. So, fine, again. Yes, I, I am seriously trying to remove my bias slash like dislike of it and just try to view it like slash critically academic it as best I can. And I think they do a good job with it, like in, in terms of that. So, yeah, I mean, this movie embrace it's an embracing the outcast story as well. Like, I mean, in a good way, you know, it's honestly a kind message to say, like, she could say, like, I'm hot, I'm the queen, this is my house, like, I this is my domain, basically, right? And instead, she wants to stay at their place and do things for them and what i mean yeah go it looks like ian has a, a comment on but, that but the doors have no problem with regicide yeah well the queen's a queen's a bee you know so yeah, but, but you know, yeah i'm sure but they didn't do it to her like you know there's an invasion of the house the animals there's all kinds of surprises they, they like things the way they were but they didn't really like the way they were and yeah i mean this uh, i mean it's a good one for a secondary supporting i mean it's this is a literally like all of these are the definitions of these things in essence. Like the story is told with a protagonist, an antagonist, and a large set of perfectly equitable supporting characters and animals to meet into these needs. I mean, you have five seconds of a hunchman, you've got a lucky prince that sings along with her and they do the ha 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 in the beginning. And then, you know, uh, then there's a party in the middle too. Like these dwarves have, that's a good party. Like that is like, that's pretty good fun. I have to say, I mean, they know how to rock and roll. They know how to find gems. Um, they know how to whistle. Um, they know how to. <laughs> They're having a fucking grand old time over I there. I mean, Scott, hi ho, hi ho. Just take it easy over there and just let it glow, you know? Um, but I mean, on top of that, we're not mentioning we're mentioning disney as a brand but walt disney did have the ingenuity to take these characters from that story that, that there are no characteristics of these uh, dwarves and gave them characteristics this is a branding exercise the first of many branding exercises that he does that says this is how you actually make this story even more palatable you don't just 
you know, take the evil parts of it. You make some kind of cute character on the side, right? I'm thinking, you know, 80 years later, you have these minions and animals that are making the noises in the Toy Story movies and going, oh, like that's basically what the dwarves are. But the dwarves are probably the best version of that, especially when you're separating it across seven characters. You actually remember all of them. If I watch another one of these animated movies, it's not very clear. I couldn't name you, you know, the third princess in whatever princess movie. So to me, that's actually a pretty strong um, set of characteristics for this. Um, I do have a few questions about Dopey. I, I don't know about the cancel culture around that and, and what's what's going on there. But I do wonder why he is in charge of the vault, why he's allowed to leave the key next to the vault, because that seems like yeah. a big problem with the vault system. Um, and yeah, and the, grump, the grumpy blue balls question is still, is still around there. And I was at the pie question. So most of my questions have been at least dealt with, um, but, uh, or at least mentioned, but I would like to know about that key right next to the vault. Seems like a big fail. Yeah. That, that thing, eternal drove, mystery, that yeah. thing drove me nuts. Cause, um, I live definitive. I mean, I live in a very safe neighborhood. I know all my neighbors, we all know each other's cars. Um, you know, I, but like, I'm one of those people, like I got my car broken into back when I was like 19 and ever since there, I like double lock everything at triple lock, you know? I, so, so him leaving the key right in front of a bit, a thing that says vault on it drove me nuts just for my own little ODC here. But here's the thing is OCD. what you don't have in your neighborhood is a quick response posse like the dwarves had. No wonder there's no one else in this kingdom. Everyone who tried to grab that uh, that key, the dwarves chased down and beat to death. Or maybe the or maybe the uh, or maybe something the, darker. Uh, yeah, the woodland gators, whatever those sure. things were. Because it, yeah. Sure. Um, I'm yeah, surprised this... they have a security song. I mean, they did have a song for going places, coming back, and when they got there, what about the security song? Like, don't leave your house. key by the vault. <laughs> hey ho. The, 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 uh, uh, prototype Oompa Loompas. Mm, uh, sure. They have songs for all the ways they're going to mur murder people. <laughs> <laughs> behead, behead, touch that key and you, you That's uh, A, of course, you like this, Joe. Uh, Chris, it's director's cut. That's where those songs are uh, contained therein. Because they definitely wrote, you know, they, they, they made it. They, they did animation and stuff for it. Just to let you know, Dopey's not going to be saying anything I know, uh, on top of it. So he's just leaving the key, and then he's gonna, his, his clothes are going to be too big. I don't know if he lost a lot of weight, or they made it not for him, or they just left over clothes. But for some reason, he's the only one that's not allowed to have clothes that fit as well. And they, they, all of them sure. can literally turtle themselves into every piece of garment that they have, like uh, like a wizard, like Mickey Mouse wizard, you know, waving clothes scenario. But yeah. It and, and I like the I like the uh, Ian's take on the turtle. I agree with the turtle. And I'm also gonna say whoever has this definitely had a dog, because when sleep when uh, Snow White see I was about to call it sleeping when Snow White crashes and lies across three beds, I'm like, well, whoever whoever animated that scene definitely has a dog because you make the bed and it'll stretch itself all over. Um, oh yeah, and one thing it did occur to me, I'm like, ah, Disney probably given this, Disney probably should have bought. DC instead of Marvel because you know she's she apparently is the Aquaman of land so because she can she has all the she could talk well, to the creatures yeah I know but then I'll, but I'm like sitting here going ah you know you could have worked that into it so yeah well Zack Snyder's not around to make the Snow White movie <laughs> the right four hour just, version of just, Snow White uh, they're about to they're about to ask him to do that soon uh, I think <laughs> yeah I mean, and, eight, 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 eight movies already about it so I don't think they need to get him get him you know he's he's good. Excellent. All right. So, Scott, why don't you tell us about the dialogue? <laughs> Jog on. I mean, this is the one I'm going to give a zero to. Like, and again, I get it. Like, this, this is where my visceral personal distaste comes in. Sure. And like, and I forgot. Like, I, I remembered, of course, that they sing the high hole. Five minutes into the movie, I'm like, oh my God, I forgot. It's like all, it's like 80% fucking songs. So, and this is, this is referenced for you, Chris, maybe specifically, but. Okay, you're you're, you're an animated film. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're a musical. Mm -hmm. You're an animated musical. No way. So like, <laughs> I just it's just not for me. And like, you know what I gave one two themes and everything else. They just sing them at you. And like, yes, it's not that it's not there, but extremely grating for me. And I just it's not the thing that I'm into. It's it ain't my cup of tea. So I don't know what else to tell you guys. It, it's my personal visceral, like, just gut reaction. Sorry, I, I cannot personally, I'm not going to personally give dialogue a one. Even though 
I understand why you might. And the songs are still well remembered. I'm sure if you go to Disneyland right now, you can go to the fucking Snow White ride and they'll sing fucking hi at you or whatever. That's fine. An earworm is not necessarily a good song. Like an earworm is not like automatically have a positive connotation. In fact, usually it doesn't. So that's all I'm saying. And that's my whole reasoning for giving dialogue a zero. And that's it. I mean, I, I think in the opposite, I guess, I, are we counting the songs as dialogue? I'm not sure. So like in a musical, right? If you are, these aren't like, these are, this is classics. These like almost every line of this movie is a classic in essence, like just from mirror, mirror on the wall to the wishing well, to all of these songs to whistle while you were there. So the, what's that? In the original story, I believe, or the mirror thing, maybe. Sure. Maybe, but the way Disney that they're codified, they, yeah. they, they made it like, all right. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's fine. You don't like the or movie overall, but I mean, again, on the, on the level of dialogue, if we're counting the songs as dialogue, because it's 60% of the movie, um, maybe. Yeah. I mean, higher, <laughs> maybe. It is still, it's good. Uh, it's fine. And I think it's actually pretty real, realistic. And I really actually like the interactions that she has with the dwarves specifically, you know, besides, besides the, the beginning part and the, the mirror mirror and the witch and the evilness, you know, the interactions that are actually between them are very kind. They're very thoughtful. They are, they're, you know, the childish in essence, to me, it made me think a lot of, um, and the songs and how they kind of sprung up another movie that I don't love, but is understandable. It's like a Mary Poppins, right? She's like a teacher, like fixer upper, like the same, it was the same kind of realm. Yeah, we have the animals here, you know, but yeah, it's not the greatest uh, dialogue in the history of the world, you know, when it comes to like, you know, a, a film, but it's, it's very strong. It's not overbearing or like really tedious, I think, which some of these movies could be. It's not too much. Um, and yeah, it's it's a, and again a lot of this stuff is medium level one, but uh, it's it's there. It's it's another one, you know. I'm, I'm not gonna say I'm the biggest fan of this movie, but it's definitely one of the better Disney movies I've ever seen um, and remember seeing. So that's not Pixar related. Um, so yeah, there's one. Um, oh, I thought you were pointing at me. And do you have something to say? Go ahead. No, I don't have anything to say. Go on. Oh, I I, I think Joe basically said everything I was gonna say. So. Um, I'm giving it a one. Yeah, uh, Joe, you said it. So I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that. Like I said, I don't necessarily disagree academically, but viscerally, just I. This is my zero. This is my hate zero, if you will. So <laughs> sorry, Scott, yeah. Scott. Can you do like a Charlie from uh, Always Sunny? Do you want to sing a song? Because that's what I feel like the whole movie. Like, do you want to build a snowman? Do you want to sing a song? Like, <laughs> if you did that, you'd make feel a little better. Like, get a little, a little more. Do you want to sing a song? Do you want to sing I, a song? Like, I'd I'm rather them do a Charlie song than what they did in the film. So I don't. Know well, I mean you. that 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 ending scene of that is basically like a like a song from a Disney I get movie it. from yeah, I know. I mean, so, you're right. You know, I, I, and it's just, I you like the, you like the you like the delivery vehicle of it better. Better, um is is what I, I think uh might be the issue here so more tongue in cheek but like again I don't disagree with the guy's points academically like I'm admitting that outright is all I'm saying is, but this is where I, it just didn't get to me like it it says what it says on the surface sure and they're singing at you and like actually the musical we'll come to it next question but I'm still sticking with zero of a dialogue and I'll stand by it there it is okay so that leaves Joe with style yep uh so this is another one. This sets the template. I mean, it sets the historical template. You know, we're, I don't want to repeat it over and over again, but I do like, you know, the storybook opening. Like, these things were not existent, I mean, maybe somewhat before, but we're still talking so long ago. That book is, you know, there's that human, like, you're in the world, and then you open the book, and then you're in the magical world, and you go, and you're right into uh, the the queen, and then you're right into, or, I, I, no, right into Snow White and the Wishing Well, and it starts with that beautiful, I mean, beautiful, like, it's it's so, it actually is really, you know, you look at it that much longer, it's still really well drawn, it looks, it looks crisp, it looks beautiful, like, this is, you know, it's not modern, but it is classic, it's a classic piece, and, you know, art-wise, detail-wise, sharpness-wise, each character has good characteristics, um, the score goes the, the back and forth responses inside of the song I found to be very kind of, um, you know, almost like surprisingly how intelligent a lot of this was. So, um, yeah, I mean, that the, that wishing well, the one where she does whistle into it and it echoes back and you see below and you see the water rippling and every everything like that, like that's a 
that's like a, a like amazing thing. Like it's still, it was like, this is, this is actually beautiful, like right here. And so style wise, it's an animated movie, you know, and it gives the Disney playbook. It gives the Disney castles. It, it frames it. It has those um, settings and actually appreciated when I thought about the pricing and, and value and the expense, they probably had to shrink how many settings there were to draw backgrounds for over and over again, potentially that there's only like, and that's how you save money on things, right? In a real movie, I'm guessing they're like, well, let's just stay in this like dark room. I mean, the dorm's house for five songs. Or right, and that's fine. And they're outside by the well, but they're, you know, it, I mean, it is like supposed to be old time. How many places are there? Um, you know, where's she supposed to go? But yeah, this is a, actually probably one of the stronger ones um, between this and the songs and the collection and the collective action. So um, Disney, Disney, Disney for the win on, uh, on a one here. Now, I'll get, every point, every negative I just said about dialogue, I'll ship directly into style. Yes, it still looks great. looks crisp. I think uh, you tell me, Joe, like I was saying the E. I'm not, I couldn't tell. Like, so I watched it on Disney Plus, obviously, but it seemed as if like, they kept most of the, like they didn't do like some overbearing, like, oh, digital remastering or like right. you know, digital repainting or whatever. It looked, and if that's the case, it still looked really crisp given the case. Like maybe just the, the animation in HD, but as you said, it's super impressive. Like, yeah, it's it's a fucking epic of an animated film. So I can ne I'm never ever going to take credit away on that front, and I will give it all due credit because of it right here. Yeah, I'm sure there was some restoration. They always did the Disney collection type scenario, but I don't think there was anything over it. If you look into some of the history, it's more that they took so much painstaking effort to get like skin tone right, which was not really a feasibility. Like, you know, that's why there's a lot more animals and different colors, but the human skin tone was almost impossible to put on celluloid. So they went through so many combinations. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm sure they sharpened Chris some stuff up, but they didn't go HD on this. I don't know when you watch on Disney Plus, right? It was still in four, three aspect ratio, it, it, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and like, still like, I'm pretty amazing, sure so. they're keeping it like very like even if they did like a little like you know little touch-up job they did not like go like i don't know i guess full star wars or something like shit like that like whatever it still kept it had that distinct very distinct 1930s feel to it and i did enjoy the animation so as i was watching it, i went in attempting to think about what this would have been like the first time you saw this in theaters in 1937 uh just going into this spectacle uh, and it must have been very, very impressive. And it's still, to a certain, it, it, it's dated nowadays, but it's still uh, impressive for, uh, uh, I think, for what it tried to do. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a very strong uh, one. Yeah, I mean, things before that weren't even in color, right? And voice yeah. matching, too. Like, the voice matching is actually really amazing for that time period that, you know, you're 10 years out from the first talking movies. Like, literally, you know, so I don't know. Don't want to. But yeah. you're right. that's, that's actually, uh, right. actually, wasn't this the first film in color? No, it wasn't okay. Um, but you know, I, I walked into it the same way you did, uh, Beth, and I got the some Blu ray about whatever, what, whenever it came out 10 years ago, or whatever. Um, and we haven't really watched it since, so I was sitting there like trying to imagine, you know, what it would be like walking in here. And there's a couple things I did notice as somebody who's, uh, you know, we were taught, we were marveling at the fact that this is before you know, computer stuff and Disney didn't start injecting in CGI until uh, Beauty and the Beast. And I'm, as a big fan of anime, um, one of the things that you see are sometimes they'll use a static image and then they'll, they'll do a pan on it or, 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 or uh, they draw focus in on it. And then they put the, then they start the animation. It's a, it's a slight thing. You can kind of tell with the coloration and so forth, but I'm like, wow, they, they've used that trick up until you know i mean fuck i mean I, I i've seen anime up until you know fairly recently that still uses that so i think it's a cool thing one other thing i want to made mention of and this is something that's pretty typical of the time whether it be bugs bunny or disney is they interject little homages to stuff because um there was fairly early on um snow white singing and she does this ha 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 something it's like a little line right out of the uh queen of the night from the Zalba flota by um mozart uh uh the magic flute by mozart queen of the knights aria uh it's a coloratura aria and there's like a little little motive of it and i was just like that's fucking cool as hell whoever wrote the music was like i'm gonna throw some mozart in there because we're used to you know in these things and and like some of the birds that are you know or the um you know the dwarves do it you do they take contemporary things 
Um, but I really, Beth and I both twigged immediately to the, to that little lick. So uh, we cool, really, right on. Nice touch. that's the one I love. That's, that's in the wishing well area. She does it yeah. into the well and she goes back and forth with it. And it's like a, a, a reprise, a reprise or whatever you call it, where it repeats itself type thing. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I was, I was very, uh, we were really, that was really fucking cool. And one more thing. I love the harmonium, the, um, the uh, pipes on the, that Grumpy was playing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I want that harmonium. I will accept, you know, he was order it now. Order it today. He was able to control the air, you know, with each butt cheek on the thing. It was uh on his little stool. I thought that was the sharpest thing. I de but yeah, this is definitely getting a really strong one. I don't see that you can't. Yeah. Even I cannot, you know, cannot yeah. give it a one here. But but there but there is it's an amazing how much of the art in this thing um, you know, carries through today. So I'm giving it a very strong one. Well. And that leaves me to recommend, and yes, I recommend this. I recommend seeing it, um, if nothing else, for the historical context, um, because it is a, a good, is a solid piece of art, um, if nothing else. It's worth seeing just for its artistic merit. Uh, the story's fairly simplistic, um, as we discussed. There's like the beginning and the end, and just kind of chilling out with the dwarves, which is, which is fine. It really, the pacing was quite good um considering it was just basically a hoot and it was like basically one night with these eight people hanging out and eating and drinking and playing music and dancing that was the vast majority of the of the movie and you know like i said whatever you may think of it uh it's definitely worth a watch um so yeah i'll give it a recommend not gonna rec recommend it but yes it should stay in the afi like again Understand the academic divide versus my visceral personal opinion of it. So I personally am not going to recommend Snow White, but it should stay in the five for for all the historical reasons and all the facts that you guys laid out. Uh, yes, of course it reverberates throughout pop culture. There is no Disney, I guess, without like every, and everything else. So sure, I, I will give it credit on that front, but I'm not going to recommend it. I'm not going. I would never have watched it if we weren't doing it for the podcast, anyways. So again, you know, bitter old man, Thurlow zero, only because of that, but not because it's bad. And it certainly is culturally and pop and, you know, relevant in the zeitgeist. So grumpy. Yeah. Grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> I never said I wasn't dudes. I think, I think I, there's a timeless quality to it. Uh, and I think that if you have kids or, like that it's a good film to watch with them uh and you're part of the disney canon so uh yeah i mean it's not the roaringest uh uh, uh recommendation of all time but like it is what it is for a reason and um i'll give credit for that yep uh it's it's an 80 minute movie it uh definitely has a little slogs but you know even it if you're felt you long know, i'll say that too sorry joe it that? felt longer than 80 minutes to me at least is all sorry. yeah and that's not uncommon for a movie that doesn't hold your interest i think we that happens uh oftentimes but if you know if you're you are a parent you probably and you, especially if some young girl you've probably seen this already it's not like we have to recommend it <laughs> i don't know if this movie's for kids uh that's a whole other story that we've kind of touched on but um yeah, I mean, I don't think uh, I would have sat around and picked uh, Snow White out of the pile of everything on Disney Plus, but watching it, sure. I mean, it's I I do love film history, and I think I'm kind of happy I have watched this, so I actually know what the difference between Snow White, um, Sleeping Beauty, and Cinderella is. I don't think I'm gonna watch the other two to double check that, but at least I know, at least I know that this one is not the one where she's there's a prince charming but it's not the same one and there's no ball and there's no glass slipper i'm not a fan of the glass slipper so um and i really do like uh i do really loved going through on the dark hole of the history of snow white afterwards so i know we didn't go deep into those but i will say there are like three or four good like uh ian i know I mentioned the the greek the greek story and uh some great you know multiple rape history stories murder stories uh stabbing stories so even if it's just like reading the plot summary, watching the couple of segments and saying you watch Snow White um, and getting the story. Yeah, do it up, enjoy. Cool. All right, so um, if nobody has anything else to say, I'll divvy up the scores. What do we got? Um, we all agree that this film's a two. Um, basically, Joe, Ian and I agreed on everything. You agreed on a two? What? 
what? no for a plot we all agree oh, oh sorry you plot it too um and the but uh scott gave it a zero for dialogue and does not recommend the film so three of us gave it a nine scott gave it a seven which gives us gives us an aggregate score of 8.5 sure which i actually think is right on the money for this uh, I historical abso- purposes absolutely i absolutely positively think this is right on the money for this i don't think it's a 10 film but i think it's a uh, I definitely think it's well above average, but maybe not a 10 film. So I, I think 8.5 is yeah. so hey Scott, good call on your dissension because I think you brought the score right for it. Well, let's just say a bunch of 35 year old white men with no children are gonna be reviewing Snow White. Put that one on the on I'll the I'll sing a song line. about it later. I have like 130 children. So okay, uh, well, yeah, I've got yeah. Uh, I, I say that my employees are children, so I don't know if we can that was from before. So yeah. Yeah. I'm 51 and Never wanted kids, so sorry. Cool. The- you cut this part. <laughs> Why? I'm. I don't care. But anyway, <laughs> Scott's trying to wrap this up, and I think that's a good idea. So, um, if nobody else has anything else to say, I am Ansi Chris Morgan, your host. Um, here with Jonathan Ian Manser. You're so vain, <laughs> Scott. Sing a song, do a trick, you're fucking useless. And Joe Soria. Scott's bashful. I'm sleepy. So <laughs> yeah, I'm Nancy. Yeah, I guess that's where it lies. Sure. And I bet you think this song is about you. Mm-hmm. Everybody have a good night. You need just- to finish it. <laughs> <laughs> you left it hanging there. But thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Editing and engineering by Christopher Morgan. Music by Christopher Morgan. Check us out on YouTube and iTunes for the shows. And on Facebook and Twitter for updates.